the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee, and by thee be happily ended through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, Mother of the Creator, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> This conference is on uh, the metaphysical principles, but I'm going to talk about a lot of other philosophy in the process. The first thing I want to make an observation about is how we actually know God. There's two ways that we actually know God. So God is actually known in two ways. The first is through the natural light of reason. The second is through revelation. And they have different, different, there's different reasons for it. The natural light of reason, of course, is what we can actually know through God. You can know his 16 attributes, that he's all good, he's all wise, etc. That he's omnipotent, omniscient. You can know that purely through the natural light of reason, starting with proofs for his existence and there, from there unpacking those. You can read the Summa Contra Gentiles of St. Thomas and he lays it all out for you in that process. So we can know certain things about God. The First Vatican Council, of course, said that, uh, defined that you can actually, they didn't say which proofs prove it, but they said you can know that God exists and certain things about him through the natural light of reason. That does not give us access to the interior life of God, nor to knowledge about the Incarnation, and that's why revelation is necessary. So those two things, those are the two ways that we know God. Both of those start in sensible reality. All of revelation was introduced into sensible, physical, created reality. So the burning bush, you actually have Christ coming and preaching, it's all taught through us through the senses, so it all begins in the created order. The natural light of reason, St. Thomas begins every single one of the proofs for his existence with rooting it in what can be known through the senses. This is why they said your cosmology, that is, what your philosophy of nature is, determines what you're going to believe about God. So these two things, so primarily I should say the natural light of reason then, how, what, your, uh, because, what your philosophy of nature is, because these things are introduced through nature, they're known through nature, that is, we know God through nature, either in the revelation, etc., even though those things are being done supernaturally, they're above and beyond the nature, but they're still done in nature. The fact is, is that that means that the only way we can know God is through nature, and that means your philosophy of nature is going to determine what you know about God. That also means, therefore, it's going to determine your understanding of creation, ultimately. And not just the uh, creative process, I mean, not just everything that exists, but it's actually going to determine how you're going to understand how these things came into existence. One of the things that St. Thomas says is, is he says the source for our information about creation is in the, now it's in the created order. He said the problem with it is, is it does not provide enough information to know exactly how things came to be in the beginning. He says this in his uh, um, discussion on um, its De Tate Mundi, on the eternity of the world, because he's trying to deal both with Aristotle saying that the world is eternal, which is what we're hearing today, and then St. Bonaventure who's saying, no, through the natural light of reason you can actually know that the world began in time, etc. And so he's trying to uh, approach those two particular things, but he says, look, in the end, we have to have, we have, to have appeal to revelation because revelation is the only way we're going to have certitude about these matters because if you look, and we see this even in the case of looking in the fossil record and things of this sort, there's not sufficient information there to tell us exactly how this all came about. This is why God had to come and set the record straight about this is how it happens, this is who I am, etc. Okay. Then, in relationship to knowing God through the natural light of reason, that's actually part of metaphysics. So both of these determine the cosmology, or the, the uh, what in philosophy we call it physics. 
just comes from the Greek word phusis, which means nature. And then from this, of course, we derive the metaphysics. And then in the metaphysics, there's three components. The metaphysics is what we can know above and beyond those things that are physical, purely physical. The first is called first philosophy. And this is what we're going to study a little bit in this conference. This is the, this is, first philosophy is the, is the science, it's a science, by the way, the term science, if you talk to a scientist, most scientists cannot give you a definition of the term science. Which is, in fact, your definition of the term science is a philosophical statement. So either philosophy is a true science, not in the empirical sense, but it's still a legitimate science. It's an organized body of knowledge of things that are causes. That's its definition. Or it's not. If it's not, then you've got a philosophical definition of a science, which means you have an unscientific definition of a science, and then you've got a problem on your hands. Okay. So either philosophy is a legitimate science, and so is theology, or it's not. In fact, you can read the first, my first, in my um, first chapter in my book on psychology. I lay that whole thing out. But the point being is, is that the, the science of first philosophy deals with first principles, and we're going to talk about what those actually are, and then we're going to talk about how evolution can't line out with the first principles. The next is what we call ontology. And this is just the study of being, in the most abstract sense. And by that we mean things like, what's it mean to exist? What's the essence of a thing? That's really, when, when the whole discussion of a species, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later, that's what that whole discussion is really about. What's the essence of a thing? Uh, and then from that, what are its various attributes? That's what we're looking for, that are proper to that particular essence. So ontology and then natural theology is what we can know about God through the natural light of reason. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to take a look at first philosophy, and the, that deals with principles. What's the nature of a principle? Uh, a principle is defined as that from which something in some way follows. That from which something in some way follows. It's, it, it's the beginning of the process by which uh, either in the order of being, which we'll see here in a minute, or in the order of thought, there's something that's first and everything else flows from that. It's a being or truth from which being, that is something that exists, change, knowledge, or discussion respectively starts. In, in, it's, in, it's the beginning in two ways. One, in the order of being. So God is the first principle in the sense that he's from which everything else flows. But also there is first uh, principles in the order of thought. So I have to agree on the first principle of identity, which is a thing is what it is. If I can't agree with that, then I'm not acting rationally. This is a key point because St. Thomas says that we have a particular natu natural habit. That's what he calls it. And he calls this... Intellectus Principiorum, which is the understanding of the first principles, structured into the human mind and intellect, is a set of principles or a governance according to these first principles. In other words, what that means is, is that God built into our intellect an inclination so that as soon as I hear the words, a thing is what it is, and I hear that formulated all together in once, and if I know the definition of those terms, then the intellect will immediately see that it's true. Okay. All of the first principles are that way. They're in immediately self-evident. They're immediately known, once they're formulated, they are known as true. 
St. Thomas and Aristotle says the only people who do not see the truth of first principles are the insane, the mentally ill. We're seeing that all over the case. Right. In fact, that's one of the things I'm going to basically show, show hopefully, is, is that if you look at the first principles, evolution doesn't meet the criteria of being a rational hypothesis in the end. Okay. So it can be a cause. In fact, most principles are causes. Anything that is in way first, if it has no connection with later members, so it's the first in this process. There are three different kinds of principles. The first are what's called real principles. These basically, uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a principle which describes the way things exist or are. So it's a being from which another being or modification of being proceeds in some way. Real principles include beginnings, the foundations of things, their origin, their location, their condition, uh, any kind of tie, uh, cause or any kind of type or elements of, of, of composition. But they describe the nature, so when we formulate the first principles or first real principles, they describe being in some way, so a thing is what it is, or um, a thing cannot not be and be in the same time and in the same respect, which is the principle of non-contradiction. It's a description of reality. This is the way reality is. Okay. The next is called a uh, logical principle, and this is a principle of knowledge. It's a truth from which other truths proceed. A source of knowledge or a cause of thought. This includes things like definitions, signs, questions, problems, sources of truth, axioms, norms, premises, etc. It's also a rule of logic. As I mentioned, God put these principles structure them into our minds so that it actually governs the reasoning process, how we actually think. That's what it's designed there for. So you can even do this with little children. We know it's part of the intellect because you just have to look at, you look at a four-year-old, I've actually done this, although I hope the parent didn't find out. I said to him, I said, the grass outside is purple. He looks outside and he sees that it's green. And he looks at me, and he actually used this word. He looks at me and says, you're whacked, and he ran off. <laughs> Why? Because in his mind, there is a structure built in that the senses tell him it's green, and I said it's purple, and there's a contradiction. So someone must be false, and it isn't his senses, by the way. Okay. But this is something that's built into our mind. It governs how we think. It's also a methodological principle, a rule of procedure that is particular to a science. So certain sciences will be employing different kinds of principles than others. But the point being is, is that this is a structure that's built into our mind that governs how we think. And it's there. So the only people who don't follow these principles, if they actually understand the terms that are involved, because once in a while you'll get people who don't seem to understand the terms, but if they understand the terms and you give them the formulation, if they deny it, then they're literally irrational. They're self-evident, as I mentioned. Okay. So we want to take a look at evolution. Does evolution, because evolution is actually a description of reality, of things, how they're supposedly changing from one thing to another, and we want to just take a look at it. So if it's a description of reality, we should be able to size it up against the various principles to see if it's actually true or not. Okay. The first I want to talk about is called the principle of degrees of being. And this principle is formulated this way. A thing is perfect to the degree that it is in act. Now, act just means in existence. And imperfect insofar as in potency. Okay. So a thing is either, uh, a thing is perfect or not perfect. 
one of the two. And it's based upon whether it actually has all the things that are proper to it, that the, the things that proper to it exist in it or they don't. The corollary, however, is a little bit different. It says, the order of the universe displays a gradual scale of perfections from one end to the other through all essentially different intermediate steps. What does that mean? It means that if you look at the created order, there's a hierarchy from the lowest kind of element or stone all the way up to the highest physical created being. And actually, if you're looking at the totality of existence, also included even the angels. This is why in scripture it says God created man a little less than the angels. So that Adam, originally, his level of intelligence was just below that of the highest angel or the lowest angels, sorry. So you have this gradation of being. So, and this, this gradation is an important point because it means that uh, there's a few other principles I want to bring in before we fall over all the conclusions. There's principles of degrees of material being we find in material living bodies, we find an ascending order of perfection in which the higher beings have their own perfections as well as those of the lower level of being. In the unity of a higher being, the multiplicity of lower beings is virtually present. So one of the things I argue in my book on uh, metaphysics of evolution is that what evolution is doing is, is committing the fallacy of overgeneralization. What it's doing is, is, it's taking this hierarchy of being, you even see it because they put the various animals to step up, etc. Or you might even see those charts, etc. But what they do is, you know, when they break down all the different um, species, what they're doing though is, is that they're taking a hierarchy and then they're overgeneralizing it saying that just because things are in a hierarchy doesn't mean that one the lower things in the hierarchy have come from or the, the higher things in the hierarchy have come from the lower things in the hierarchy if the hierarchy doesn't indicate that one thing is actually going into another or that one thing caused another then and we'll see this in the end you can only cause either that which is the same or that which is lower than you but they can't cause the things that are higher, which we'll see in a minute, but it's an overgeneralization of the hierarchy of being into a philosophical system that's saying that one thing comes from another. To say that one thing, that is that one species comes from another species, is rooted in a philosophical system, which we'll see in just a little bit later. So it's the fallacy of overgeneralization. The order of the universe displays a gradual scale of perfections from one end through all essential different intermediate steps. So the universe constitutes creation in which there is a perfection at every level. It connects these principles indicating the hierarchy of being and its constituent structure along with other things which we'll be discussing a little bit later. The principle basically states that the inference from possibility of being or action to actual being is invalid. What does that mean? Just because potentially, you have actually, we have a hierarchy. Potentially, one being could be causing another. But until you actually see the causation or until you have concrete evidence for the causation, then to do that, to go from saying, well, they're in, and that's essentially what they're doing in evolution. They're taking all these different intermediate steps and potentially there could be some connection, but what they're saying is there's actually a connection. And that actually violates the principle of valid inference. Just because they're in a hierarchy doesn't mean one came from another. Until you can show me concretely, either in the fossil record or whatever, however you want to be able to be able to legitimately do it, you have to be able to show it, otherwise it's an invalid inference. So to go from a lower to a higher, then we have to ask ourselves, well, what about the principle of sufficient reason? So the principle of sufficient reason basically is formulated this way. The existence of a thing is accountable either in itself or in another. That's the technical formulation of it. The existence of a thing is accountable 
In other words, you can look at this thing's existence either and it itself explains why it exists, such as in the case of God, whose essence is his existence, or it has to be accountable in another thing. Okay, and that accountable means that that other thing actually has to have the capacity to cause this thing to exist. Okay, in modern parlance, we would simply say, you can't give what you don't have. That's why it was so unfortunate when, was it Dawkins or Hawkins, that said, creation, or it, it created itself, right? The way I heard it said was, it, it, the, the gap between nothing and something was so infinitesimally small, it just jumped out. <laughs> of course, your immediate question is, what's this it you're talking about? You've got nothing. There's no thing to jump out here, right? And what is important about this inference thing is, is this was the criticism that St. Thomas gave of Anselm's ontological argument. Just because I can think it in my head doesn't make it real in reality. So just because I can think of this thing kind of popping into existence, you know, which is basically what? Me adding to this thing something, right? But the fact is, is that it, if there was nothing there, it couldn't pop into existence. The same is true even in evolutionary steps. To go from one being to another being, which is in a higher state, if it's going lower, that's one thing. But if it's going higher, the, uh, we'll see this a little bit later, the, that thing doesn't have, it's not a sufficient reason for the cause. It can't give, as I usually use the example, it can't give sight to something, something that doesn't have sight can't give sight to something else because it doesn't have the sufficient metaphysical act, we would say. That is, the metaphysical existence sufficient to be able to cause that. Okay. So, this is an important point because essentially what they're asserting is, is that there is this, uh, in fact, the, the, the guy who really started the problem was Hume. Hume came up with this idea of constant conjunction. That is, if one ball is going along and it hits another ball, he says, I do not see the transference of causation. I don't see that this ball is actually causing this other one to move. I just see one touching the other one and it's slowing down and the other one speeding up and going away. That's all I see. And he said, that being the case, the one, let's see where the invalid inference is, because that's what I see, therefore, the one is not the cause of the other. Well, wait a minute. Just because that's what, you, you don't go from what you see necessarily to knowing whether it is or isn't the cause, but we'll see how that works out here in a second. But that means, he said, that uh, then what I can do is, that means that this other one isn't caused, the one speeding up or being moved isn't the caused by this other one, and so technically, it just starts moving out of nowhere, technically, if you remove the looking at this other thing, right? Well, first of all, most people would look at him and say, this guy needs a rubber room <laughs> for two reasons. One, it's a violation of the principle of sufficient reason to say the ball is just all of a sudden giving itself motion when it doesn't have it. You can't give what you don't have. The second component is, is the fact that from that came this idea that things can go in and out of existence without there being a cause in relationship to it. That's partly where that actually came from. But that's a philosophical error because it's a violation of the principle of sufficient reason. The reason I know that the one causes the other is because of the fact that I know that one, uh, that one can't simply start moving on its own. I ha it has to get its action or motion from somewhere. The fact that this one touches it in movement, there is reason immediately sees. It's also a, a violation of the principle of motion. Now the principle of motion states this. A thing is either moved either in itself or by another. Okay, so either the ball already has within it the capacity to move itself in some manner, 
or it has to receive that motion from someone else. It's a, it's a first principle. And our human intellects know this. One of the problems with modern philosophy, it actually began with Descartes and his skepticism about whether the senses were actually telling him and what were there. I tell people, look, we, we, we are putting people in mental institutions for the very same thing that this guy became famous for. Right? This isn't even rational. And yet it becomes this huge, from there you get Hume, because Hume ends up uh, adopting the Cartesian skepticism. It, those two come together in Kant, and by the time you get done with Kant, then you're down the merry path. And in the end, the people who really hold Kant to the, his feet to the fire say, well, in the end, you can't know God. Okay. But the point being is, is that these, if you violate the principles, you're going to end up in an irrational situation. Okay. The other thing is, and this is something that actually has to do with ontology. And in ontology, we, we make a distinction between the nature or essence of a thing, it's what the thing is, is different from its accidents. And the accidents are those things which exist in us. So for example, the color of your hair doesn't determine whether you're a human being or a goat. Right? You can have different colors of hair and be a human being. Your race doesn't determine whether you're a human being or not because that's part of your nature. Okay. So the point being is, is that these accident qualities like color, shape, etc., those, those things exist in the thing that has that nature. They used to say that Catholics were natural metaphysicians. And the reason they said that is because we already know this distinction. The Eucharist, when you look at it, the church would say that's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our dearly beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But under the appearance of bread and wine. And so Catholics automatically knew that how a thing appeared wasn't the same thing as its nature. But they do t it does tell you something about the nature. So for example, if you look at the accidental qualities of gold, they are not the same as the accidental qualities of silver or of an amoeba or of a human being. The accidental qualities are different. Okay. Why is this so important? It's because there are essentially three kinds of accidents and they tell us something about a, uh, two things. One is whether there is such a thing as micro or macro evolution and then the second thing is, is what they can and cannot do, what these accidents can and cannot do. So there's three kinds of accidents. The first is what we call per se accidents. And the per se accidents are accidents that always accompany that always accompany the uh, thing. They're sometimes called proper acts. They always accompany the essence of a thing. So for example, having an intellect, the intellect in a human being is an accidental quality in us, St. Thomas says. So anytime you have human nature, a body soul composite, you will always have an intellect and a will. It may not, the full aspect of the intellect may not be fully developed because the brain may not be fully be there, etc. but you still have it. So these are things that always are proper to the thing. One of the uh, examples I always give is, is that skim milk is not really milk because the proper accident of milk is fat. And without fat, it's not real milk, okay? But anyway, these are the things that are proper to each thing, okay? The next is those accidents which are common to many in a species, but not necessarily to all. So for example, man, generally speaking, has hair on his head, but some men are bald. These accidents, so the proper accidents tells you the nature of the thing. So human beings, what distinguishes us from other uh, animals is the fact that we have rationality. We're a rational animal, right? Yeah, we're an animal, but we're a rational animal, which puts us in a different category. We're essentially different. It's not a matter of degree. We are essentially different from every other animal. Second is then those which are common, so these, actual, these accidents reveal the nature, as was shown, um, for example, if a person has a man's hair, or what have you, or a beard, etc. Then there are those accidents which aren't too common. 
in, in these things, but they're still within the gamut of what that thing can have. And this would include like red-haired people. There's not too many red-haired people out there. Okay. So those are the ones which are common. Oops, common. And those which are uncommon. But still do something. All three of these reveal the nature of a thing. But the accidents are also that through which the thing acts. What does that mean? All our faculties, sight, hearing, smell, uh, the faculty of speech, the um, intellect, the will, etc. Each time those things act, if it was my essence or nature acting, every time they would act, I would change into a different nature. So every time I knew a tree, all of a sudden I'd be a tree instead of actually a human being. But instead, this is something that exists in my human nature, right? So I can think of a tree and I don't, cha I don't change the essence or nature of it. So all, all things that act or uh, do anything whatsoever in relationship to either in themselves or to other things that are created act through accidents. Why is that important? It's because accidents are lower in the order of being than essences are. Now let's go back. What does that concretely mean? It means that the accidents in one species is incapable of causing the essence, which is higher in the ontological order. This means that even if there's all these environmental factors that go into the primordial soup, etc., the fact is, is that they cannot cause, because they're acting through their accidents, they cannot cause an essence which is in a higher order. That's what that means. And it's all based upon the principle of sufficient reason. So if you analyze this stuff philosophically, an accident and everything acts through an accident, cannot cause the essence of another thing. So that means, therefore, that an accident cannot cause another species by its very nature. Another um, proposition is called operation follows upon being, or action follows upon being. The nature of the action, or it's the nature of the being, determines what kinds of action it is able to perform. In evolution, and this, this gets formulated in another way, it's called the principle of resemblance. Like begets like. The problem with evolution is, is it's essentially saying like does not beget like, and a thing is able to, that, that, the thing, that how it, its existence doesn't determine how it acts in the end, ultimately. Because what they're really saying is, is that you've got this other thing that's of a higher order that's actually being caused, we mean higher order in the philosophical sense, it's being caused by something of a lower order, or it's being caused by something that is different from it. In other words, the kind of order, for example, that you see in the human DNA and body is not within the capacity of pure matter or other things or any other thing other than God to arrange it to that level because there's nothing in the created order that has the capacity to beget that level of order. Okay. So like begets like. That means that what? Uh, amoeba. That's what that means. Something without sight is just going to produce something else without sight. It's not going to produce something which is going to uh, be higher. And we actually know this, right? The definition, you've heard this, which actually is not true. I can give you a formal definition of insanity, but it's a very long one. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, thinking you're going to get a different outcome. Isn't that what evolution is? <laughs> I mean, you're basically saying that you've got all these causes. The whole foundation, the whole foundation of science is to know that there is an order of causation that doesn't change and therefore you can predict the outcome. Well, if that's the case, then why are we saying that I'm going to keep doing the same thing over and over again and get something different? Okay. The, uh, the principle of proportionate causality. The effect 
This is the pr uh, principle of proportionate causality. The effect cannot be greater than the cause. Something that does sight is a higher state than not having sight. And so, as a result, to have sight is not capable because of the principle, the effect cannot be greater than the cause. Something causing it, so the cause can't be get stuff that doesn't have sight, can't be get something that does have sight, which is greater than itself. These are all things that we know through the natural light of reason. We know this. We just know this instinctively, and we behave according to it. Uh, the principle of resemblance, as I mentioned, like begets like. Another variant of the principle of resemblance, which is really important, and this is where the rubber meets the road, substance can only beget substance. What does that mean? We just got done looking at it. Accidents are incapable of causing a substance because the substance is higher in the order of, na of ontology. It's, on, it's a higher in the order of uh, being. This means that only a being that can act through its substance is capable of causing another substance. And there's only one being that meets that description, and that's God. That means that, and this is what the scholastics always said, that God is the only cause of any substance or essence. Because he's the only one that can be. Not even angels can cause another substance by basic, on the basic metaphysics of it. And so God is the only one that can actually cause another essence or substance. So, this means that macroevolution isn't possible purely on a philosophical level. Now, some people are going to come back and they're going to say, well, wait a minute, but what if the science shows that it happens? Science is not capable of showing it. It's just like science is not capable of showing that 2 plus 2 equals 5. It's not capable of it because it doesn't do that. Being do beings don't do those things. So, the proposition of it you know, and you hear this all the time, you know, well, if we just find enough evidence. Well, it seems to me that the more you dig around and the more the evidence comes up, the more you're finding out that it's not producing what you're saying it's producing. I keep telling everybody, you know what, there's, this is one of the reasons I think that God is letting us do all this space research and science and space, outer space, is because the more they look, the less they find that there's life anywhere else but here. And the reason being is, is because, and I'm not saying that God couldn't put life in other locations, but what I'm saying is, is that this business of, oh, well, if you got just the right building blocks, life will come out of that. What they're finding out is they got the building blocks, but there ain't no life. That's what they're finding. Because it doesn't have the capacity to do that. Another one is called the principle of evidence. This principle, it's got five different variances, and I want to go through each one of these, because this is the one that's really a sticker right now, I think, among others. The objective evidence, so this is what the principle is, the principle of evidence, the objective, objective evidence of being is the criterion of the truth of assent and the motive for certain assent. What does this mean? Well, first let's back up and let's look at the terms here. First, we have to define what truth is. Truth, St. Thomas defines as adequatio intellectus et re, which basically means the adequation of my intellect to the thing, actually, he says in his commentary on, uh, or his uh, De Potem in, in De Veritate, which means what? The created intellect, in order for what my, it's in my mind to be true, it has to conform to the way that things are in reality. You know, I, I worked for a number of years as a mechanic with my father, and I learned a lot of very important lessons. And one of the things I've learned is, it doesn't matter how you feel, either the thing's fixed or it ain't. <laughs> right? So, you know, and one time I got really angry, my dad's just knock it off and go fix it, right? How I felt, I mean, today people would say, well, I feel it's fixed. Well, that's fine, but it ain't running yet. Right? So the point being is, is that the intellect has to conform to reality for it to be true. This means that the objective evidence of being 
is the criterion of truth. What's that mean? Created reality. The evidence in reality is the criterion for whether your hypothesis is true or not. It's not your preconceived idea. And so really, someone who's really pursuing the truth should really be doing, trying to do what? I just want to know what, what the truth is. I want to know what reality is. Okay. Uh, is the criterion of truth of assent in the motive for certain assent? What's that mean? The degree of evidence, in other words, the degree of certitude that I have about a thing is directly proportionate to the degree of the evidence for it. No more and no less. This is exactly where scientific precision, philosophical precision, and theological precision has taken it on the chin. We see this in the church. Modernism has transposed the objective criteria for truth because they bought into the whole conscience, uh, epistemology, and metaphysics. And they've transposed it to the criteria for truth is whether my concepts are coherent and what, what my internal state is. They've transposed it to how I feel, ultimately, in the end, if you end up with Schleiermacher. But the point being is, is that it's uh, the transposition of the truth, criteria for truth, to internally to us, in the end, is going to end up in a, in a rational system. We have to conform our intellects to the thing. So the precision, once that happened, once it moved to my interior state, Precision comes from being, things. Things give me the precision, not my thought. It's only when my thought is in congruity with those things exactly as they are that I have precision in my thinking. That meant that as soon as they transposed in revelation to my interior state through modernism, that was all out the window. This is one of the reasons why uh, precision in theological thinking is completely shot. This is one of the reasons why a lot of guys, you even see this in the debate about evolution, there's this fudge factor that they think is okay to get away with. There's no real precision. One guy, in criticizing my book, he said, well, the book was okay, but the problem is he brought principles into the discussion. <laughs> okay, because why? Well, they're too precise. Precisions are too, uh, uh, um, principles are too precise, right? For him, in that sense. It's precision in philosophical thinking that is everything. It's precision in um, scientific thinking that's everything. And this is one of the reasons why when uh, evolution is a preconceived formation that people receive in the beginning, it literally affects their judgment so that their judgment is affected when it comes to looking at the evidence. And so they actually think they have greater certitude in evolution, uh, in evolutionary, in the evolutionary hypothesis than they actually do. In fact, the very fact that it's a hypothesis, it's not a law. And as a result of that, they think they, they're, but they're treating it like it's a law, which actually just means it's a sign of, uh, it's one of their beliefs. A variant of this principle is the thing in the condition of evidence is the measure of the truth of judgments. So it doesn't matter what my hypothesis is, it's the thing that's gonna tell me whether it's true or not. This is one of the reasons we do experiments, because the experiments actually tell me if my hypothesis is correct or not. Which, by the way, the entire structure of the scientific methodology is a philosophical construct. It's a legitimate one. But we have to make sure that we understand that these are philosophical discussions at root. There is no argument against the evidence. It's like I said, either it's fixed or not. If it's not fixed, you can tell me all you want how much you, you feel like it's fixed, but it isn't fixed. No inference contrary to the facts is true. Let's back that up again. No inference contrary to the facts is true. This means that if I have a hypothesis and there is one piece of evidence, one piece of evidence that contradicts my hypothesis, either the hypothesis in total, that is in whole or in part, is false. That's what that means. Evolution's got a bit of a problem on its hands. 
because of the fact that you've got so much evidence that's piling up that's actually contrary to it. I talk to scientists, I, whenever I find out there's a scientist that's on a very high level in science, I'm always trying to seek them out and ask them, you know, what do you think of evolution? And I have yet to find one that says, oh yeah, it's, it's true. They usually say, no, it's got problems here, 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 and here. But they don't say anything because it's uh, professional suicide. Yeah. Variant. An explanation or hypothesis must take into account all of the evidence. So those two part variances are the flip side. <coughs> so no inference contrary to the fact, uh, a, to a fact or to the facts is true. So if one thing hypothesis, the other con, the other one is is that it, uh, if your hypothesis is going to be shown to be true, it has to take into con consideration all of the evidence, all of it. And so these two things are what you're seeing, um, and that's the beauty of this week, is you're going to start seeing, look, there's a lot of scientific evidence that doesn't line out with what they're uh, actually proposing. Okay. The next one is the principle of economy. This is formulated in a couple of different ways, and it needs a bit of unpacking. The principle of economy states, an explanation that accounts for all of the facts in terms of a single or few principles is preferable to the more complex theory. In other words, if I have to come up with a number of different complex things to try and explain something, and this is what you're actually seeing with evolution, right? They have to, they're try, every time you turn around, they're trying to modify this thing and it's getting more complex, at least it seems to me. But the one that's just simpler is easier. Evolution ends up multiplying causes without a sufficient reason. In other words, the explanation that God, metaphysically, because you can, uh, you know, accidents can't be get substances, and God therefore is the only cause of these things. Therefore, God is the cause of each and individual essence of, of things. That is an easier explanation and preferable explanation because it reduces the number of causes than, you know, there was this two or three billion or how many every billions of years of pro evolutionary process that you want to bring into in order to account for it. Each mutation must come generally from a different cause or from the same cause on a number of different occasions. And this itself multiplies the number of principles and makes the theory a number of causes and makes the theory more complex when it's easier just to say God brought the thing into being as it is. Okay, the next formulation of that principle is an explanation of any phenomenon is to be regarded as better and truer in which the minimum number of factors, the fewer steps in the process, and more immediate causes are included. Let me read, read that one, because that, that just flies in the face of virtually everything we're seeing in evolutionary, uh, evolutionary hypothesis. An explanation of a, any phenomenon is to be regarded as better and truer in which the minimum number of factors, the fewer steps in the process, and more immediate causes are included. So what does this actually mean? Well, it means a couple of things. The first is, is that theistic evolution still holds to all these different causes in order to account for why this thing came into being. How is that the case? Because they know, they, they, they admit that the principle of sufficient reason obtains, that is, it's true. And so as a result of that, what they say is, is that because of the principle of sufficient reason, one thing can't beget something that's higher, and so God has to step in at each individual case and process through the evolutionary process. You're multiplying God's causation without a sufficient reason. That's the problem there. The fact is, is, is that God could just bring the whole thing immediate into existence at once. We're going to see why that's true more later in the next conference. But you don't have, you're multiplying causes without a reason, which means you're violating the principle of economy. And most theistic evolution, I have yet to find a theistic evolutionary theory that doesn't violate the principle of economy in the end. Because basically they have to multiply miracles. The other difficulty is, is that the gap between nothing and something, now this is interesting, this is what St. Thomas says, 
which is completely contrary to the modern view of it, you know. It, the gap between something and nothing was so infinitesimally small, it just jumped out. Actually, St. Thomas says, no, the gap between nothing, because nothing is infinite, it's unbounded, between nothing and something, that gap is infinite between nothing and something, even between nothing and a single element like hydrogen, a single hydrogen atom. That gap to go from there, from nothing to something is infinite. And he says that's why only God can be the cause of the essence of a thing or the existence of a thing because only He is capable of bridging that infinite gap. All these, and so as a result of that, if He's going to bridge this infinite gap, then I don't need all this infinite series of things or number of things to bring about this thing because why? Each time it goes up in the scale of being, there's an existence that has to be added and that requires an infinite power. Which means that the material order, the natural order, can't provide for it, so God's got to step in and that means there's a miracle every single time that happens and you're multiplying miracles without a sufficient reason. It violates the principle of economy. Another formulation is, in identifying unseen cause of phenomenon, the least cause capable, the least cause capable of explaining the phenomena must be accepted. A proportionate cause is required and suffices. So, for example, miracles must not, th th another way that they sometimes formulate is, miracles must not be postulated as an explanation of an event when natural causes suffices in the circumstances. The variant. A demonstration of an, the necessary truth of some unseen cause, reason, or theory requires both proof of the necessity and the suitability, which means it fits together in a proper way, the suitability of the explanation offered and the exclusion of the other attempted explanations. What does this actually mean? It means that if you're going to have to assert all these different miracles in order to get this theory to maintain this theory, which by the way I tend to think that most uh, Catholic evolutionary theories or Christian evolutionary theorists um, or theistic evolutionary theorists, basically my experience is it all boils down to human respect. They really just want the respectability of the si of, of, in the relationship to the scientific community and acceptance along that line, rather than actually, where's the truth? You know, I don't care what, I don't care what they think. I just want to know the truth. Okay. So, if the natural process used by God then above, uh, then all of the above violations of principle would likewise be in case. God has to supply on the side of the principal reason, principle of sufficient reason, as I mentioned. It ends up violating the principle of economy. And also the principle of economy because ultimately uh, what's being stated here is that nature does not suffice in order to produce each individual species on its own. So this means the theistic evolution, uh, whether it states that it is a natural process, which is really just a covering, uh, a, a covert way to introduce constant miracles. It's a natural process. It's not a natural or asserts outright that miracles are constantly necessary with the rest violates the principle of economy. We know this because of the fact, and most of us have said, you know, as I, as I observe this, and I observe the people trying to argue in favor of evolution, after a while you're like, look, it's just easier to believe that God caused this thing. I mean, I, I, the amount of suspension of belief I have to have for the evidence you're prese uh, presenting, plus all the machinations I have to go through, it's just, this is the easier explanation. Okay. In a certain sense, do we know what the term deus ex machina means? Okay. Deus ex machina is a term in means it was they used it in the Greek plays and they, they would back the main character, um, the antagonist or the protagonist, sorry, into a corner, right? And there was no way he could get out. And then all of a sudden God would swoop in and change the circumstances and everything would be fine. That's exactly what we have going on here with theistic evolutionary theory. They're basically, they bring God into the thing to solve specific problems, but it creates its own other sets of problems and makes it even less believable. Okay. 
evolution and the problem of essence is not changing. And we'll stop with this. The word, the term which uh, Aristotle uses for essence, if you, if you read his metaphysics in Greek, he actually uses this particular term. I'm not going to put it in the Greek, term, the Greek letters, but it's toti estin. Let me make sure I get that last word right. Ani. It's been a while since I've read it. And it literally means that which is to be. That's what it literally means. That which is to be. In the history of philosophy, essences, the, 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 that term that which is to be gets uh, transliterated somewhat inaccurately into Latin during the medieval commentaries into the quad quid erit esse. That which was to be. Now why is this important? It starts with Plato, but St. Thomas even takes it up. St. Thomas asks the question, are the divine ideas true? What are the divine ideas? The divine ideas are the essences of all created things as they exist in the mind of God. And as they exist in the mind of God, they are eternal and never change. And so as a result of that, the, the term, the, uh, the toti estinena, or the quadcader essay, had an eternity about the, the very connotation of the term meant it was something that didn't, wasn't subject to change. We know this to be the case, so there's a kind of timelessness to essences, or the nature of things. We could even say the species. It doesn't mean that their accidental qualities don't change over the course of time. Which, by the way, if we go back to the three kinds of accidents, what does that mean? It means that even though the essence never changes, there can be different accidents in relationship to different substances, in relationship to the second and the third kind of accident. But as the first kind of accident, that one always remains the same. But in those other two, there can be a variety of different accidents. And those accidents can be acted upon externally and modified from externally. How do we know this? Go lay out in the sun and see if you don't tan or burn, one of the two. In other words, the sun can cause the accidental qualities to change in me. So what does this mean? It means that microevolution, which is really what? Evolution of accidents can occur within the confines of what that particular essence or species can sustain in its nature. So let's back up. Each nature determines the kinds of accidents that it can have. So as a human being, I can't have the same accidental qualities as a bar of gold. Okay, obviously. You know, even my, even my hair is different from a bear's hair, I hope. Okay. But the point being is, is that the accidental qualities, human beings or any other essence, has a, there's a gamut or a range of accidents that it can have. And that means that external factors can cause the, moder moder uh, the modification of those accidental qualities within that range of things. Okay. That being the case, that means that you can have microevolution, what they call microevolution, but you can't have macroevolution because it can't be sustained philosophically. That's how we know that the, the macroevolutionary theory is unsustainable just as a hypothesis because it's irrational. It's like saying 2 plus 2 equals 5, and it doesn't. So back to these essences, that means the essences never change even though the accidents can change. We already know that God must be part of this on a purely metaphysical level since to go from nothing to something requires an infinite power. Regardless of whether one holds to the Aristotelian theory that the world has always existed or whether one holds that we know uh, by revelation that God created things out of nothing from the beginning, it does not matter as to what pertains to this particular issue. It doesn't matter whether the world's eternal or not because that's, by the way, that's a new theory that, uh, not a new theory, it's an old theory. The, this, this idea that the universe is uh, forever expanding, contract, expanding, contract, expanding, contract. You know, this, it's going on and on and on. That idea is nothing new. But that doesn't really matter. While we know from Revelation that God did create everything ex nihilo, 
And the uh, and we also know, which I'm going to talk about, the, the doctrine of dependence, the metaphysical doctrine of dependence. We're going to talk about that because it's been brought up a little bit. It's been mentioned, but I want to parse that out, especially in relationship to deism, and see where the problems lie, because that's where the important part comes between creation and improvidence. St. Thomas points out that even if one holds that the world already existed, God still has to be the cause of it in relationship to essences, which come into existence only through substantial causation. They cannot come into existence by means of accidental causation. Substance can only come from substance. That's the principle. The principle of resemblance indicates that no created thing, since it acts through its actions, can be the cause of a higher substance. For accidents cannot cause substances, as I mentioned, because they don't have sufficient uh, act, a metaphysical existence. <clears throat> this means that uh, life cannot come from non-life. Non-life just begets non-life. Only that which has life in some analogous way can beget something that has life. The inverse of this principle logically compels the conclusion that inorganic substances cannot produce organic substances. Logically, also, for inorganic substances would just produce inorganic substances and not organic substances. So if I put a bunch of primordial soup together, run some lightning through it, in the end, all I got is some rearranged primordial soup. That's all I've got. I don't have life. Rather as, whereas God has to actually introduce into it, he's got to step into it to actually produce the life in order for it to be there. And that means that it's not going to come in an evolutionary process because if it did, then we're back to the problem of, of as the theistic evolutionists, evolutionaries hold, which by the way, there's another big problem that they have, which we'll talk about in the next conference, but it violates the principle of economy. Okay, we'll stop there. If you want to stand, we'll pray. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, seed of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.